In this video, we're going to create and deploy a full ERC721 NFT collection to the blockchain where the NFTs have metadata that is fully on the blockchain. No IPFS, no centralized servers or anything like that. All of our metadata, including the image of our NFT, is going to be stored directly on the blockchain. By the end of the video, you'll have NFTs that look like this, and all of it will be done using Solidity and our contract kit. If you're excited for it, let's get right into it. Before we jump into the video, I wanna let you know that currently 70% of the amazing people like yourself that watch ThirdWeb's YouTube videos are still not subscribed to the channel. So before we begin, I'd love to ask you a favor. If you get any value out of these videos, I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe to the ThirdWeb channel. And a little tip is we're going to be airdropping 10 users who have subscribed to the ThirdWeb channel, a very special NFT every week. So today we're talking about NFTs with on-chain metadata, metadata stored on the blockchain itself. But what is the alternative? Well, in the very early days of NFTs, some projects uploaded their metadata for their NFTs on centralized servers, such as AWS or Google Cloud Platform, and hosted their metadata on the centralized servers. Obviously, you can already tell that doesn't really fit with the vibe or the ethos of Web3 in general. So developers started moving to a decentralized storage option called IPFS. And our first example that we're going to look at here is the Board Ape Yacht club, which is one of the most popular, if not the most popular NFT collections uh, in the world. And if we take a close look at the page here on OpenSea for this uh, red ape here, we can scroll down to the details of the NFT and you can see here we have metadata and it says frozen. So it says the item's metadata was permanently locked and stored in a decentralized file in storage. And if we click into this URL, can see it takes us to an ipfs.io slash ipfs and a big long uh, jumble of numbers and letters. And then we have the token ID of the board ape over here, so number 985. And the contents of this URL, what's actually hosted at this frozen URL is JSON data. It's simply just a JSON object with fields such as the image here, which you can see again points to a separate IPFS URL. It has the attributes such as the background, the eyes, the mouth, hat, fur, et cetera, et cetera. But if we go to this link with the image and we paste that in our URL, we'll get rid of the token UID, token ID, sorry. You can see this actually stores the image of the NFT that we're going to be looking at here, which is the Board Ape 985, which is a separate IPFS URL. Now, data that's uploaded to IPFS is generally considered to be decentralized and immutable, which means not one storage provider such as Google or Amazon owns control over the files that you're storing. It's in a decentralized storage provider, which is a little complex and I'm probably not the best person to explain it, but it's essentially stored on other people's computers and you can pin files in IPFS to make sure that at least one person is hosting a copy of this file somewhere. So at no point does your file disappear off of this decentralized network. You can pin it to make sure that that doesn't happen. So that's kind of the second step of the wave of NFTs and how you could store metadata in a decentralized way. And this is the most common standard that you'll see in most of today's NFT projects um, where they'll use IPFS to host it in a decentralized way so that the project owner doesn't have full control over the metadata of the NFTs and there's generally less risk involved where you don't have to pay the bills to keep the metadata alive on a server such as AWS. And one party isn't um, making sure that the images or the metadata for all of the NFTs is actually up and running because if your server goes down, then your metadata for all of your NFTs will also go down. So that's why this movement towards IPFS and decentralized storage occurred. But the alternative to IPFS is to actually store the information on the blockchain itself 
rather than uploading it to this decentralized storage provider. Now, a great example of this is the developer DAO or the Devs for Revolution NFT collection, which is an example of on-chain metadata for NFTs. So you can see here, they're not as fancy and they're not as uh, detailed in their artwork. And that is because they have to pay to store this information. They have a very low limit of how much data and size they can actually store on the blockchain. So you can see it's very simple with the these kind of traits that each NFT has, and it's in the theme of developers. So this developer has Windows 1, Sublime Text, uh, they use COBOL, they have Black Hat, and et cetera, et cetera. So these are kind of um, the traits, I guess, is the equivalent for the Devs for Revolution NFT collection. Now you'll notice if we go to the details down here, there is no token metadata field that we can click into. And that's because there is no URL that's storing or hosting the metadata for the NFT. There's no URL hosting the metadata for the image even. And you might be wondering, okay, so there's no URL, where is this image being hosted? And that leads us to base 64 encryption of images. And I don't have a tab open for this, so let's open one up. Base 64 images, so you can see Base64 is essentially just a way of uploading an image and transforming it into this big long string or encoding it into Base64 is kind of the technical way of saying that. And that allows you to store that encoded value, that encoded representation of the image data into the blockchain. So you don't need to upload the file anywhere. You encode it and store that encoded value on the blockchain itself. And that value can then be decoded to transform it back into the image in that kind of visual representation. So this is the value you're storing on the blockchain. And an example here we're looking at on the Devs for Revolution is the metadata for the uh, zeroth NFT of that collection. So we're looking at the image data here or the metadata for the NFT on the Devs for Revolution. And if we compare that to the Board Ape Yacht Club, zero, you can see this is pointing to that IPFS string that we were looking at earlier for the token ID zero. So you can see the difference already. The metadata isn't being stored at an IPFS link, it's being stored in its kind of true encoded form on the blockchain directly. So there's no external link that you need to go to to fetch that metadata and load it. It's all just stored on the blockchain. So you might be wondering, what is this token URI function that we're looking at? And that token URI represents the metadata for the given NFT, which is this first argument they need to provide here, which we're just providing the zeroth NFT of that collection, and that returns the metadata for that NFT. So that's what token URI is, and that's how we're gonna be kind of building out our own on-chain NFT collection. But what you can do is you can literally just copy and paste this into the browser, and you can see here, it's the same exact result. This just points to or kind of gets um, decoded into its true form where it's just pointing to this JSON information. And you can see it has a name, it has a description and similar properties to what was stored in the IPFS URL for the Board Ape Yacht Club collection is kind of decoded into this JSON format here. So for the image field, we have um, rather than another IPFS URL, we have a image here. So if we copy and paste this, you can see here's the actual metadata or the image for the NFT that we're looking at. And all of this information is stored on the blockchain itself and there's no IPFS or URLs that kind of points to the metadata. It's all just stored on the blockchain itself. So that's what we're going to be building in today's video. And we're going to be using ThirdWeb's contract kit to do so. And contract kit, we have a great video on the portal by myself. Uh, obviously I love my own videos, but here is the introduction to contract kit. It allows you to build out complex projects Projects in Solidity with powerful base contracts such as ERC721 base contracts, which we're going to be using today, that allow you to kind of extend and customize the functionality, which we're going to do to allow us to upload the on-chain metadata for each of the NFTs. So with that background knowledge, let's jump into actually building it. So the first thing we'll do is we'll bring up the terminal and we're going to use the ThirdWeb CLI to create a new Solidity smart contract project for us. To do that, we'll run npx ThirdWeb and to get the latest version of the CLI, we'll add at latest and then create. 
and we'll chuck that into the terminal here. And what it's going to ask us is first, do we want to create an application or a contract? For us, we're building out a smart contract project. So go ahead and select contract for this question. We'll give our project a name. I'll call mine on chain NFTs. We'll select hard hat for the framework. And here's where it asks us what kind of contract we want to start from. And we're going to build an ERC721 non-fungible token collection here. So let's go ahead and select ERC721. And the final question here is what extensions do you want to add? Now this is kind of important depending on what kind of project you're building. If you want to release your NFTs for a price, you can select drop. But if you're following along with the video, just go ahead and select none here. So we're going to just have a bare bones ERC721 NFT collection. Now what this CLI is going to do is going to create a new hard hat project with Solidity and create a new Solidity smart contract that has ERC721 NFTs enabled by default. So we could actually just deploy the contract that is generating for us um, if we want to, but obviously we're going to create um, this kind of on-chain metadata logic and customize our project a little bit after it's been created here. So now it looks like it's done. Let's change directory into the on-chain NFTs project that we just created and I'll open it up in Visual Studio Code here. And if we zoom in, you can see in the contracts folder here, you'll see a Solidity smart contract called contract.sol. And here we have, whoops, we have a contract is ERC721 based. So let's walk through this together just so you're familiar with what the CLI has set up for us. So in this single smart contract that it's set up, we first import the ERC721 base smart contract from the contract kit. Now you can walk through actually what's going on inside of the contract kit if you go to the documentation on the portal. I'll just bring it up for you in the background here. You can see the base contract that we started with was this ERC721 standard or ERC721 base as it's called in Solidity. So you can see all of the features that are available in the smart contract that you're importing. So for example, we implemented the ERC721 standard. We have Mintable, which allows us to mint NFTs into the smart contract, which is always good. We can burn NFTs, we can batch mint NFTs. Our actual smart contract has a metadata field and an owner field in these two here. And we finally have royalty on the secondary sales of the NFT. So these are all the features that we have by default and you can actually detect what features you have in your smart contract by running yarn build. And this is going to compile your smart contract using the framework that you selected. In our case, it's going to use hard hat. It's going to compile it and print out all of the features of the contract kit that you've implemented, such as all of the features that we're looking at in the portal here. So either way, whatever you want to implement, if you want to add some extensions like um, platform fees, primary sales, batch minting metadata, whatever you want to add to your smart contract, you can add it, implement it, and then just detect it within the CLI here. So with that kind of background information, let's go back to our smart contract. Uh, before we do that though, this is actually what we're importing. And if you want to view the base kind of Solidity code that we're importing, you can either view it from the portal URL here, you can see all of the source code for what the actual contract is doing. Or if you're using VS Code like me, you can just control click into it and view it inside of this window here. So that's all of the source code you're importing into your smart contract here. And then in this line six, we're saying our contract called contract, which we can rename to be something more meaningful like on-chain NFTs, is that ERC721 base contract that we're importing. Now, when we're saying is, it means we're extending or inheriting all of the logic that we've imported from this smart contract here. So that allows us to use any of the functionality that's available inside of that ERC721 base smart contract inside of this uh, smart contract that we're building out here. And then the final kind of piece of the puzzle is the constructor. Now, if you're not familiar with Solidity, the constructor is code that gets run when you go to deploy your smart contract to the blockchain. So this kind of sets up the smart contract as it's initialized. And here we just have four kind of parameters that we can provide when we deploy it. We have the name of the smart contract, we have the symbol of the tokens within the smart contract, 
which is the ticker. So it would be like one uh, symbol in your wallet if you have one NFT, for example. The royalty recipient is the wallet address that receives the royalties. The royalty BPS is the basis points of royalties that you're going to take on secondary sales. So for example, if you set this to 500, you would have a 5% royalty fee. And that is it for the constructor. So it's kind of this three-step process of importing it, inheriting it, and then implementing it, so three I's, I guess, in our smart contract here. So that's what we have ourselves set up with, just so you're familiar with what you're actually doing when you're running these CLI commands. Now, the final thing we are going to set up before we start writing the solidity required is install this kind of helpful utility that Open Zeppelin provides called Base64. And as the name suggests, if you remember what we were talking about in the kind of introduction of this video, it allows you to transform any bytes into its Base64 string representation, which is going to allow us to uh, store the metadata on chain. So that's what we're going to install. And to install the Open Zeppelin contracts package, you can go to the overview page here and just run npm install at Open Zeppelin. I'll zoom in at Open Zeppelin slash contracts. So I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste that into our terminal here. So that's going to allow us to import the actual base64 smart contract from Open Zeppelin. And I'll go ahead and add that on line five here. So you can see, we can click into it. We have this base64 kind of utility library available to us in our contract now. So beneath the constructor here, we're going to start writing out the logic for our on-chain metadata. And if you remember, we looked at the developer DAO um, kind of image here where it's just simple text that's kind of randomized from a preset list of words or strings that is being printed out line by line into the metadata. And we're going to replicate this behavior. So for example, in our contract, what we're going to do is I'm going to create three arrays of strings here. I'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste it in. It's quite simple to replicate. So if that is uh, uh, shocking at first when I pasted it in, don't worry, we're going to walk through it now. We have a array of strings that is private called blockchain. So the first kind of randomized selection that we're going to be making is a random blockchain in our case. So in our metadata, the user will get a random blockchain selected for their NFT of Ethereum, Solana, Arbitrum, Phantom, Polygon, Bitcoin. So you can see just random kind of words that we've selected in the array of strings here. And you can populate this as you choose. You can, don't have to use blockchains. You don't have to use anything that I'm using in this video. You can completely customize it to whatever you prefer. Beneath that, we have the exact same thing. We have an array of values that is going to be randomly selected. We have dApps such as AVAX, Orca, Uniswap, MakerDAO, Magic Eden. And beneath that, we have tokens. So it's just kind of random values that are kind of meta to uh, what we're building here. So that's what the values are that we're going to select in our smart contract are. And then we'll write the logic to pick one of these random values out and print them onto the kind of metadata that we're um, piecing together. And just to make sure I'm not taking the credit for writing the code for this logic here, I wanted to make sure I show you the code that I'm sort of um, pulling this from, and that is the loot collection here. And if we take a look at the smart contract, you can see we're going to utilize methods that we're going to create in our smart contract, such as the pluck method to get a random function from the array here. And I would definitely recommend you check out this original kind of smart contract that I'm using as inspiration for this one. So let's head back to our smart contract and we'll write our own pluck function in our contract here. So to do that, we're going to write a new function called pluck that accepts three arguments into the parentheses here. The first one is the token ID. Second one is the key prefix. And we'll talk about these two as we start to build out the function. But the third and final argument here is the source array. And the source array is going to be one of these three string arrays here where we're passing in the actual um, array of values that we want to grab a random selection from. And we're going to utilize a combination of the key prefix and the token ID to create a random selection. So in this function, we're going to utilize a random function that we're going to write later on in the smart contract. But what we're passing to that random function is a string that utilizes the encoded token ID combined with the um, key prefix that we have here. So it's encoding both the key prefix and a two string version of the token ID. And that is another function that we're going to write in the smart contract. And essentially all of this is doing, it's a little bit intimidating, but all we're doing is we're creating a random value 
within the bounds of what we're passing in as this source array. So in the next line here, we're then going to create a new string called output, and this selects the value that got generated in this random number here, and utilizes it to select a random value out of the source array that we passed in. So we're kind of generating this random value utilizing a combination of key prefix and token ID. We'll talk about what those are as we start to build out more of the smart contract. We're utilizing a random function and a two string function that we're going to build out. All this is doing, just pretend none of this code exists, all we're doing is creating a random number that we're utilizing to select a random string out of one of these three um, string arrays to grab a randomized value that we can utilize for the NFT metadata. And finally, we just return that value that we grabbed randomly from the array. So to complete our pluck function, we need to create the random function and the two string function. Now again, in this video, I'm just pulling directly from the loot smart contract here with uh, some of the specific functionality for on-chain metadata. So we have this two string function available and this looks a little bit complicated, but you can see it's inspired by Oracle's API's implementation. You can view the full source code for that here. All I'm going to do is copy and paste this in. The kind of implementation is not as important to me. Based on the signature, the value that we're passing in is a uint256, which is a number. The value that gets returned is a string. And if you've ever used JavaScript, you've used the toString method, which converts something to a string equivalent value. So all we're doing with this function, as I'm going to paste it into my smart contract here, is that we're converting a number, in our case is the token ID, and returning the string equivalent value of that in Solidity. And that's just the implementation details within this function here. And remember, if you want to access the full source code, it will be linked in the description if you don't wanna write any of this code yourself. Beneath that, we're going to create the random function, which is essentially doing the opposite. It's taking in a string and returning a uint256. So if you remember, we converted this string that we were passing in, combining the key prefix and the stringified version of the token ID, converting that to a uint256. So that's all we're doing. We're passing in the string, converting that to a number based on this conversion here. Now that our pluck function is complete, we can utilize it to create three functions, one that selects a random blockchain, one that selects a random dApp, one that selects a random token. And we can create these functions beneath here where we have a function called get blockchain, takes in a token ID and plucks a random value out of the blockchain's array. So we pass in token ID as the first argument to pluck here. The key prefix is blockchains. The final value is the actual array of blockchains that we're going to pluck a random value from. So quite self-explanatory, we're just getting a random blockchain. We're doing the same for dApps, we're doing the same for tokens. And you can just repeat this process for each of the arrays that you're going to be randomly selecting from. And I just realized I've missed the fifth value here. So we'll go back and fix that after we are done here. But what we're gonna do with all of these parts is we're going to concatenate them all together with this encode pack method. So we've got a big long string of all of the parts that we just set up, part zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all joined together in this string called output here. What we're gonna do with that output is we'll use the base64 library that we imported at the top here from Open Zeppelin, and we're going to convert this to its base64 value. And this is kind of the final step of the puzzle. We've created this string or this SVG with all of these kind of dynamic elements where we get a random value, get a random value, render them all as text inside the SVG. Then we encode them using this base64 utility library. What we need to provide to this encode is a set of bytes. Within the bytes, we're going to provide a string. And as you can imagine, we're going to encode packed again. We're going to concatenate all of the output values with a kind of JSON format here. So here's where we actually define that JSON value for the uh, metadata of the NFT. So for example, we could have a field called name and we can give it a Web3 card plus the two string value of the token ID. So for example, we're rendering token ID zero. The name of that of the metadata is going to contain a field called name Web3 card number zero. Again, we can add any fields we want in this metadata here. Let's add a description on chain NFTs created with third web. 
The most important part though is the image. And we're adding the kind of 64, base 64 rendering of an image. So we have data, image, SVG plus XML, and that's just going to render our image. And then we use a base64.encode. The output, which if you remember above, is the actual strings combined to create the SVG here. So this formats all of the metadata into the JSON and we can store that in a field called JSON here. Now within JSON, we have this base64 encoded value that we can use to store all of our metadata. So it's kind of this nested base64 to actually store the whole metadata object. And then within that object, we have another base64 encoded value to store the image, which is the SVG kind of uh, concatenation of these parts here. So beneath that, we're finally gonna say output is a stringified version of this. Of course, adding any metadata tags that we need to represent this data as JSON in base64 format. And then finally, returning the output. And you can go back and fix this up to be parts five, parts six, and add as many parts as you need into this string array. I'm just gonna leave it as is because I know this code works. Okay, so now all of our solidity is complete. We can actually go ahead and deploy our smart contract to the blockchain and mint an NFT to see what the result is. So let's jump back into the terminal here and we're just gonna run yarn deploy. And behind the scenes, you can see this is running NPX third web at latest deploy. And this is using our CLI to deploy the smart contract to the blockchain. So if you wanna learn more, you can use the portal here to discover how deploy works, how to deploy your smart contracts using the CLI as we are in this video. But essentially what's happening is we're compiling our smart contracts, making sure there's no errors and that compile successfully. When that compilation process is successful, we are uploading the ABIs. So you'll see in the uh, directory here, if we go to artifacts, we go to contracts, you can see this big long file of everything that our smart contract is capable of doing is being generated. And this is uploaded to IPFS. And then when that process is done, it's going to generate a URL. As you can see here, it's clicking, sorry, it's generated a URL that we can click and open up in the third web dashboard here. So I'll go ahead and connect to my wallet. I'll deploy this smart contract to a testnet just for demonstration purposes. So here you can see all of the fields of the constructor that we need to uh, populate here. So I'll zoom in. The first one, if you recall, is the name of our smart contract. So let's say on-chain NFTs. The symbol, let's just give it a chain or on-chain or something like that. And this is just the ticker for each of the tokens in your collection. The royalty recipient, I'm just gonna use my wallet address here, paste that in, and I'm just gonna set a 0% royalty fee on secondary sales, just to keep it simple. Down the bottom here, you select the network that you wanna deploy your smart contract to. So you can see, you can deploy to any of our supported EVM mainnets or one of the test nets as I'm going to do in this video. And a test net, if you're not aware already, is just a uh, kind of mock uh, blockchain where you can use test funds and you don't have to use any real money to deploy your smart contracts. <clears throat> Excuse me, your smart contracts. So with the deployer here, I'm gonna go ahead and select Goeli, which is the Ethereum test network. And I won't add mine to the dashboard. This is just if you want to view your uh, smart contract on the Third Web dashboard. So if you go to dashboard, you'll be able to see all the smart contracts that you've deployed here. If you wanna add it here, I'm just gonna keep it simple you can tick this box. But for me, I'm gonna select go early and I'll go ahead and click deploy now. And this is going to prompt us in our wallet to accept this transaction that we see here, the contract deployment transaction. So I'll go ahead and confirm that. And this is going to deploy the smart contract that we've just written in Solidity onto the Goerli Ethereum testnet. And this is coming completely from my wallet. This is not controlled by ThirdWeb. We don't have any servers or anything like that to interact or control your smart contract. This is 100% owned by you and your wallet. So when that deployment uh, process is complete, you'll be taken to the dashboard for your smart contract. And you can see here, we have the contract explorer, which we can use to view the token URI. But what we can do is we can go to the NFTs tab and you can see since we implemented ERC721 Mintable on the smart contract, we have this mint button here. 
Now, this looks a little bit funky because we kind of assume that you're going to be using IPFS, but in our case, the token URI is actually being set to that kind of on-chain metadata here. So we can actually just put anything we like here and it's going to be overwritten in our smart contract anyway. So let's just say dummy value. We don't need to upload any media. We don't need description or any properties. This is all going to be ignored. We're just going to uh, write the mint transaction to actually create that new NFT. And in our smart contract, the token URI, which is what's get used to show the metadata is going to be what we see on the dashboard anyway. So any metadata we upload here is not actually going to be used. So here we can just upload the, sorry, we can mint the NFT, except this mint to transaction here. Go ahead and confirm this one. And when this is complete, we'll be able to see the NFT in our dashboard here, the NFT that gets minted with the on-chain metadata. And then I'll show you using the Contract Explorer how you can just confirm that this is actually an on-chain NFT with on-chain metadata. And we'll show you what that looks like for this smart contract as well. Excellent, so it looks like that transaction has gone through. And you can see in the background here, the NFT has been made for us, the NFT has been minted successfully. We can see the media here and we have this nice pink background. If we zoom in, it looks like we've got Bitcoin, Uniswap and AVAX, so pretty cool. We have the pink background, but what we can do is we go to the Explorer, we can go to the token URI here and for token ID zero, the NFT we just minted, we can run this and we can see the on-chain metadata for that NFT. So if we go ahead and copy and paste this into the browser, can see we have our NFT metadata here with this on-chain JSON file here. And for the image, we also have the same thing. If we go ahead and copy paste that into the browser, you can see here is the nice bright pink and white text. And you can see I got Bitcoin, Uniswap and AVAX. And I've just selected a random one from each of those three arrays that we defined here. And you can get creative with this. You could customize how the logic of this gets selected. You could completely customize the look and feel and what values are available to be selected for your NFT metadata. And if you want to see what your NFT looks like on OpenSea, what you can do is go to your dashboard page, copy the smart contract address, and you can go to testnet.opensea.io, paste your smart contract address in here, and you can see on-chain NFTs is here. And we have our first NFT here with Web3 card with the token ID. And then you can see the metadata here and the details. We shouldn't see any token metadata fields since it's kind of replicating what we saw on that developer DAO uh, OpenSea page as well. You don't have the token metadata down here because it's all stored on the blockchain. That's it for today's build. Really hope you enjoyed building this one out. It was a lot of fun. If you do end up building something or if you have any questions at all, jump into our Discord. The link will be in the description. You can speak with the entire team, including myself, directly to answer any questions that you might have. If you do build something awesome, you can also share your project in the Built on Third Web channel where all of our awesome members will be able to see it. With that said, thank you very much for watching. Remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more awesome educational Web3 content like this in the very near future. Thank you very much again and we'll see you in the next one.